the second lecture uh, of the, what we call the introductory course to Nichiren Buddhism. And uh, the first lecture, for those of you who may have missed it, was about uh, what we call the ten worlds or the ten basic states of life. And uh, in the course of that lecture, it became apparent to everybody that these basic states of life have uh, can display or reflect either a negative or a positive aspect depending upon uh, the effort one makes. Uh, the ten basic states, you'll remember, were at its worst hell, uh, hunger, anger, animality, tranquility, rapture, learning, partial enlightenment, bodhisattva, that is to say the state where you desire strongly to help others, and finally, Buddha. In other words, Buddhism is saying that both hell, heaven, and Buddhahood exist nowhere else but in this world, uh, in this lifetime, in the midst of our daily life. And uh, one can pass through these worlds uh, at a tremendous pace, even from moment to moment of one's life. And depending upon the effort one makes, that world will react uh, negatively or even destructively or positively. So the effort, of course, is the effort to elevate one's state of life into the highest state of all, which is known as Buddhahood. So Buddha, far from being something rather removed from this world, uh, far from being some mystic, almost superhuman figure, Buddha is in fact nothing other than a human being in the most elevated state of life that a human being can achieve, any human being can achieve, and it's termed Buddhahood. Buddha, in fact, means, in one literal sense, a human being, but human being in the sense of a whole human being, a human being that is displaying uh, their full potential uh, as a human being. So this was uh, the subject we discussed get on to the, the next time. step, which is the practice that enables one to actually attain that state in one's own life. Uh, that is to say, uh, the invocation of Nichiren Buddhism, or the chant, which is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. So Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is the fundamental practice of Nichiren Buddhism. And the purpose of chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo over and over again to one's heart's content is uh, not only to elevate one's life into the Buddha state, but also to project in that state one's desires, one's prayers, wishes, both for oneself and others. Uh, so, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is, in other words, what the Buddha gave in his wisdom as the key to be able to unlock this Buddha state which exists in everybody and begin to make use of it in one's daily life. Indeed, what Nichiren Daishonin taught was that in order to chant nam myoho renge kyo to actually bring oneself to do it, you have to be in the Buddha state. In other words, the moment that desire to chant nam myoho renge kyo arises in one's life, that desire is coming from the Buddha state. It's because it's very difficult for us to believe that. We have an image of Buddha as being something that's amazingly serene or tranquil. We see statues of Shakyamuni Buddha in all sorts of different poses. Uh, and in a sense, one rather grows up perhaps to imagine that this is something beyond the normal human being. But in fact, what Shakyamuni himself was teaching was that Buddhahood is inherent within everybody. And 
in order to bring that state more and more to be the main tendency of one's life. Nichiren Daishonin, who succeeded Shakyamuni Buddha 2,000 years later, taught people to chant nam myoho kyo So nam myoho kyo is in fact the dynamic force of life itself, the creative force which is at the same time totally harmonious that one sees working in nature or in uh, any particular phenomena of the universe. What the Buddha taught was that behind nam myoho renge kyo is uh, that force, the meaning of those words is that force of creative energy which exists in everything in the entire universe, including ourselves. So, in other words, the force or the rhythm of life is nam myoho renge kyo. The creative force that one sees in nature, the force uh, that makes the tides come and go and the moon have the effect on the earth which it does, the force that brings great winds, the force uh, that is seen in the workings of the sun in creating growth uh, and health is all nam myoho renge kyo expressed in those words. Likewise, nam myoho renge kyo of course uh, contains not only that force for good but also at the back of it is the negative part of life or the destructive part of life all is embraced in that force of life itself so as a human being of course we have free will haven't we to use life as we decide we, we are equipped with the ability uh, to make decisions. We are equipped with some free will, even though, of course, we have a destiny or karma. And fundamentally, that free will gives us the opportunity to decide whether we want our lives to act and react in a positive, creative, and valuable way or in a negative, destructive, or anti-valuable way. And it is through the practice of elevating the Buddha state through chanting nam myoho renge kyo that you can ensure that every basic state of life from hell to Buddhahood itself is working favorably, positively and creatively. So I think if you look at human life generally, one can see in this world today that this force is not existent or active in so very many human beings. The point about the great force of life is that it's not only dynamic and progressive, but it's also harmonious. Yet it's very obvious in the actions of human beings that this is not the case in human life at present in general. When human beings try to be Progressive, which of course they always rightly should desire to be, it always seems to lead to chaos and confusion. There is no cohesion in human progressiveness. What one person is doing is so often at the expense of another person. At the same time, if human beings want to behave harmoniously together, they seem, in order to do so, to have to deny progressiveness. Tremendous efforts have been made, haven't they, through history to achieve harmony between human beings, but it seems to always end in a compromise which is rather weak and wishy-washy and results not in more progress but in less progress. So how can a human being or human beings in general achieve not only dynamic progress, but also achieve it in perfect harmony. The only way, Buddhism says, 
is for human beings to make sure that each one of their lives is individually in rhythm with the force of life itself. Because the force of life itself, in its natural state, works both, both progressively and harmoniously. So I'd like to, at various points, quote from one of the writings of Nichiren Daishonin, who uh, is known as the Buddha of this age called Mapo in Buddhism, the age that began round about 900 or 1000 AD. In one of his writings, uh, written in the 13th century, called On Attaining Buddhahood, he said this, It is the same with a Buddha and a common mortal. While deluded, one is called a common mortal, but once enlightened, he is called a Buddha. Even a tarnished mirror will shine like a jewel if it is polished. A mind which presently is clouded by illusions originating from the innate darkness of life is like a tarnished mirror. But once it is polished, it will become clear, reflecting the enlightenment of immutable truth. Arouse deep faith and polish your mirror night and day. How should you polish it? Only by chanting nam myo ho renge -kyo. So in other words, the tarnished mirror is the mirror of ignorance. Ignorance of the truth about life, which Buddhism then begins to teach. And most important of all, the truth that Buddhahood exists in everybody. So Nichiren Daishonin says, how to, do you discover this? Through the practice of chanting nam myoho renge -kyo. You polish your life and you begin to see the qualities of the Buddha state emerging in it. So this is the background, uh, all too briefly perhaps, of the reason for chanting of nam myoho renge -kyo being the fundamental practice of Nichiren Buddhism. This chant in itself is the rhythm of life, expressed in words through the human mouth. But this rhythm of life, of course, is being expressed in sound also by every other living thing. And what Buddhism is saying is the force of life or life force exists in everything and every being in the universe. So why should human beings be any exception? The life force of the universe also exists in us, but so many people don't know how to tap it. So the tapping of it is achieved, Nishun Daishonin taught, through the chanting of nam myoho renge -kyo. It's very interesting that uh, some physicists are becoming so very clear that man contain, or woman, contains two energies. One they term mechanical energy, and one uh, some are beginning to call the universal energy, or the universal force. So the physicist's approach, of course, is uh, a hypothesis that since this energy exists in the whole universe, it must also exist within the life of every human being. And this is exactly what Buddhism was teaching starting around about 3,000 years ago. That this force of life, this incredible power, this amazing power that causes uh, the natural phenomena that never cease to surprise us, also exists within the life of human beings. So if they can only tap that power and use it, of course uh, they can overcome every obstacle that faces them and begin to lead happy lives. So, uh, whereas the physicist can't yet give the answer as to how to activate that power, the Buddha said, chant nam myoho renge -kyo. And this is what uh, those of us who are members and are already practicing do uh, day in, day out, 
polishing our mirror just as Nietzsche and Daishonin taught. So this effort to put oneself in rhythm with the force of universal life itself is described or conveyed by the very Nam first word of that Yoho chant. Renge Kyo. Nam means devotion or devoted effort. You cannot uh, explain Nam properly without it including really effort. Through the effort of Nam we can get onto the track and ride uh, with the rhythm of universal life itself provided uh, we follow that word Nam with Myoho Renge Kyo which I'll explain in more detail later. So Nam is to be in rhythm that effort to devote ourselves day in day out. So in our practice uh, we chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo for varying lengths of time uh, which is entirely up to us individually at least twice a day once in the morning once in the evening what is the purpose of that this is, of course is what the Buddha taught we wake up in the morning jangled from our night's sleep maybe we've had nightmares dreams maybe we've been comfortable or uncomfortable whatever at any rate one's life is not exactly in balance when one wakes up so the first thing to do is to put it in balance with the force of life at the beginning of the day. In other words, to climb on to, uh, if you like, the top of a wave of the rhythm of life and try to make sure to get through that day on that wave top. So of course one can't do this immediately. It takes uh, time and practice and effort to build this force or tendency of life but the more one practices the more you discover that you are staying on the top of that wave for longer and longer and that that wave is taking you through a great part of the day and is enabling you to ride over or swamp the obstacles in one's life this is what is called actual proof in Buddhism Nichiren Daishonin said that the true religion must satisfy three proofs. First, literary or historic proof. Secondly, theoretical proof. And thirdly, actual proof. And actual proof, he said, is the most important of all. So through the practice of chanting, very quickly in our lives, we get actual proof that somehow something is really changing. It seems that our environment is working more with us than before. The truth of it is, of course, that we are beginning to link our lives to this amazing, creative, yet harmonious force of universal life. And therefore, of course, our environments begin to work in rhythm with that, reflecting, as, they, as our environment does, all the states that we may pass through. So very quickly, one gets this actual proof. And if it wasn't for that, of course it would be very difficult for human beings to continue to make that effort or numb. Because we get actual proof so rapidly, people feel, great, I'm going to go on with it. And through that actual proof in one's daily life, faith, in the teachings of the Buddha steadily grows and the desire to continue to practice increases. So, just to give you uh, a little background, Namyo Horenge Kyo was first declared by Nichiren Daishonin, a priest of the 13th century uh, in Japan, to be exact, on the 28th of April, 1253. What led to him doing this was that as a young boy born into a very poor family, he had gone like 
other boys who were bright to be educated at the local temple. High above his village uh, in a peninsula which is now called Chiba. And after a little while, a year or two at this temple, he was struck, even at his young age, at the confusion of Buddhist thought and teachings at that time. I don't know whether any of you know the history of Japan in that period, but it was a period of utter confusion. And Buddhism had really uh, descended into uh, a myriad different sects, many of whom were even ignoring the teachings of Shakyamuni and basing their practice on teachings invented by people who'd appeared uh, in more recent history. Yet, also at that time, Japan was in a state of the utmost chaos. There had never been such a history of natural disasters in all of Japan's history. In the 40 years or so, around the time of Nichiren's birth, there were worse and more frequent earthquakes and typhoons, epidemics, floods, droughts, and all other forms of disaster than Japan had ever seen in its whole history, and indeed more than it's ever seen since. So Nichiren Daishonin, as quite a young, uh, quite a young man, with his natural seeking mind of youth was saying, if Buddhism is really the truth of life, why is this country that is supposed to be Buddhist suffering so desperately? And he couldn't, because of his seeking mind, reconcile himself to this situation. If Buddhism is the truth, and if Japan is practicing Buddhism, why are the people suffering in tens of thousands, dying of droughts and floods, earthquakes and goodness knows what? So, uh, he, at that time, uh, had a very clear insight into life. He was, if you like, born uh, in an enlightened state. And he, basically, deep in his life, understood that Buddhism had gone wrong and where it had gone wrong. And this is clearly uh, seen by his writings of those days. But the point was, of course, he had to prove it to the people, to the ruling authorities, and to the other sects of Buddhism which existed at that time. So for many years, about 15 years in fact, he traveled around all the great Buddhist centers of learning in Japan in order to justify or validate his understanding of the, the ultimate truth through Buddhist documentation. He wished to link what he knew was right to the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha 2,000 years before him, so that people could see that clearly in the orthodox flow of Buddhism, practice of chanting nam myoho renge kyo uh, was exactly in accordance with Shakyamuni's predictions and the truths which Shakyamuni Buddha had taught all those many years ago. So having done that to his full satisfaction and having equipped himself, in, if you like, to debate with anyone who doubted or attacked him, for his views, which incidentally he had to do many times in his lifetime. He then returned to his original temple, and on that day, the 28th of April, he declared uh, that the fundamental truth of Buddhism was contained in the phrase Myoho Renge Kyo, and that if people would then devote themselves to it, in other words, Nam, and repeat this phrase over and over to their heart's content, then the people, not only of Japan, but of the world, would find that they were overcoming their unhappy destiny, changing their karma, and achieving happy and fruitful and fulfilling lives. But the moment he did that, all hell descended on him. He was a common priest, 
from a poor family. He had no status in society whatsoever. And it caused an uproar. From the very moment he declared this, uh, people from his own temple wished to attack him and the local lord and so on uh, mustered up guards to arrest him. He escaped and really the rest of his lifetime was involved in battling with persecutions in order to finally establish his teaching firmly so that it would never die when he died himself. This he, had, of course, could, uh, was able to do. The very fact that we're chanting Nam Myoho Renge today, many of us, is proof of that. So, uh, in many ways, uh, he explained why these persecutions were bound to happen to him. They, for one thing, fulfilling the predictions of the earlier Buddha, Shakyamuni, 2,000 years before. 2,000 years before, Shakyamuni clearly stated the various types of persecutions which Nichiren Daishonin or the Buddha of the age, of this age of Mapo, would have to undergo. And these predictions were all fulfilled by Nichiren said, as, un as practice strengthens and understanding grows, so the devilish forces of life will arise to interfere. Without this, he said, there would be no way of knowing that this was the true law. In other words, if you activate a highly positive force, the negative side of life will first of all resist desperately. This is in the very nature or rhythm of life in order to prevent that force from winning the battle. It's in other words the old story of good and evil forces of positive and negative that are inherent in life. So even today, when we wish to decide, or we decide we'd like to chant, say, 15 or half an hour's Daimoku, or Daimoku meaning uh, the invocation of nam myoho renge -kyo, we'll always find possibly, or often find, that the negative force rises up in all sorts of cunning ways to try to stop us from doing so. Maybe we feel like another cup of coffee even or uh, oh I must just go and do so and so or maybe I'll just read the paper first so in a sw even in these small ways the negative force is evident when you wish to start chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo this is known in Buddhism as Sancho Shima uh, that is to say uh, the three obstacles and the four devils three obstacles and the four devils being representative of the negative force of life which automatically rises up in the same way as an aeroplane when it's taking off meets the resistance of the wind in fact it's often compared to that because an aeroplane needs that resistance in order to fly yet that resistance is also trying to hold it up so in the same way the resistance of that negative force of life that battle is in fact what makes us make great effort so even the resistance is valuable in the end so it is that effort to overcome the negative force and practices of the Buddha taught which is all involved in that one word none. so that little background uh, is enough of the history but fundamentally, what Nichiren Daishonin realized was that the most important teaching of Buddhism was uh, the teaching which, not surprisingly, Shakyamuni himself had said was his supreme teaching. And this was called the Lotus Sutra. And the title of the Lotus Sutra, in fact, uh, in Japanese phonetics, applied to Chinese characters, sounds a bit complicated, is Myoho Renge Kyo. Chi that's the Japanese sound to the classical Chinese characters in which that sutra was written. Of course, it was first written, uh, in, recorded in Sanskrit. In Sanskrit, it's known as Sadama Pundarita Sutra. It was then translated into Chinese in the flow of Buddhism as it went through China 
to Japan, and the sounds of those Chinese characters are Myoho Rengekyo. So like all Buddhist teachings, the title contains all of it. The essence of the whole sutra, the meaning of it, in all its respect, is contained always in the title. So Myoho Rengekyo, that short phrase, five characters, Myoho Rengekyo, contains the whole truth of Buddhism. Economically, if you like, stored in the depths of meanings of those five characters. So, Chakramuni himself had said, this sutra is my supreme teaching. Discard all previous teachings. But this was very difficult for people to understand. And indeed, many of his earlier followers never heard him teach the Lotus Sutra, which was eight years before he died, in a total of about 50 years of preaching. So uh, that uh, instruction to his disciples of discard all previous teachings was neither understood, often not even heard, and often not therefore followed. However, Nichiren Daishonin uh, appreciated all this in his lifetime, 2,000 years later, and then proceeded to validate it in his writings and his teachings. So, in other words, Nichiren Daishonin was saying, this contains the essence of life. The Lotus Sutra concerns the essential or ultimate truth of life. That truth is contained in the title, Myoho Rengekyo. Therefore, if we devote ourselves to that sutra, which is contained, the meaning of it in those five characters, we will be in rhythm with that law. He went further to say that this teaching alone contained all the 80,000 teachings of Buddhism. Therefore, those few characters contain the essence of everything. So I hope that's sort of clear to you as a background. So in other words, uh, Shakyamuni in the Lotus Sutra was explaining his theory about life and his experience of enlightenment. But he didn't actually say how one could attain enlightenment through this sutra. The sutra clearly stated that every human being has the Buddha state in him. But the point was, how could it be activated in the same way that Shakyamuni Buddha, or Gautama Buddha as he's known sometimes, activated it? But he did say, that this sutra would be the supreme teaching for the age of Mapo, that is the age we live in now. And furthermore, he said that in that age, people would have the intellectual capacity to be able to grasp and understand this teaching and practice it. And he also, in a sutra, said that a Buddha would be born to a country northeast of where he was preaching, uh, in the early stages, the first 500 years of the age of Mapa, and this person's task would be to teach the people of those days how to find happiness through the Lotus Sutra. So this was the background to Nichiren Daishonin declaring nam myoho So in the uh, writing that I referred to before on attaining Buddhahood, Nichiren Daishonin said this, Therefore, when you chant the mystic law, Myoho Rengekyo, and recite the Lotus Sutra, that is reciting certain verses of the Lotus Sutra, which we also do every day as part of our practice, the subject of another lecture, you must summon up deep conviction that Myoho Rengekyo is your life itself. So although Myoho Rengekyo is life in the whole universe, the force of life itself, it is also your life itself. And in many other writings and teachings, Nichiren Daishonin said, unless you understand that Myoho Rengekyo is your life, you're not practicing my Buddhism. In other words, this practice does not concern an external power to which supplication has to be made in order 
to find happiness. What Buddhism is teaching is that the power is within you. Of course it's outside you too, but to no more or greater extent that it's also in you. Therefore, the whole purpose is to find the key to unlock the door and release this force in one's own life. This force uh, that uh, passing through the Buddha state has the ingredients of all the qualities of the Buddha. Qualities of wisdom, compassion, and courage, and so on. So now I'd like to just go on and explain the other words in this phrase in a little more detail. First of all, myoho. Myoho uh, has the literal, literal meaning mystic law. Uh, myo uh, is mystic. Ho means law. Uh, another way, though, of understanding this would be to say mystic is something unseen, difficult to understand. Hyo, ho, or law is something seen. So, of course, we all know that life consists of both a spiritual aspect and a physical uh, aspect material aspect. So ho, you could say, is the material or seen aspect of life, and myo is the spiritual or unseen aspect. Myo and ho also can mean ho, life, myo, death, or ho, manifest, myo, latent. All these meanings are contained in the character from yo and ho. So this is fundamental to Buddhism's understanding of the truth of life. In other words, all aspects of life, both in a spiritual and a material sense, are constantly passing through phases of life and death, seen and unseen. That every one of all the myriad phenomena of life, all the manifestations of life force that we see around us, is passing through this amazing cycle of seen and unseen. So of course we see it in life and death, in a human being or an animal, but furthermore we see it even in the spiritual qualities or the spiritual emotions. Sadness can rise up and appear and become manifest in the form of tears or a gloomy face. Something changes in that person's life and that disappears and a smile takes its place. Where does the sadness go? Certainly it's not disappeared from one's life because you've only got to have another circumstance arise for that sadness to appear again. The same with joy and all the other emotions. They become manifest, but where do they go when they're not manifest? Of course there can only be only one answer, they're latent. Always there in one's life, existing yet non-existing, as the Buddha described it. So this is what everything in life is doing. Everything in this whole universe uh, is passing through a seen state into an unseen state and back into a seen state and so on. This is part of the rhythm of life. The rhythm of life, Buddhism says, is that everything in it is passing through a cycle which is seen at one point and unseen at the other point. Or as it's sometimes described, the cycle of birth, maturity, death, and then latency, which is described in Buddhism by a very simple word, ku, K-U, and then birth again. So of course, if this is happening in the case of joy or sadness, if it's happening in the case of trees and plants and animals, why on earth should human beings be any different? It would be nothing else but arrogance to imagine that we should be different to everything else in the universe. 
And of course, this is also happening in us. And once we become aware of this rhythm of myo and ho, we can actually see it working in our own lives. We can realize it act in an actuality in our daily life. So this is myo ho, this constant cycle of every living thing in its state of uh, manifestation and latency. So the period of latency has a purpose. And that purpose is again is linked to the law of nam myo kyo The purpose of the period of latency is to activate sufficient life force in and around that entity of life so that it is strong enough to support another physical surrounding. To appear, in other words, once again, which it must do in the very rhythm of life, in physical form, and contribute to the functioning of this world and of the great universe. This is the period of latency, which we call death in human terms. Yet, it's far from death. It's no different from sleep, in a way, in that we must sleep in order to gain energy for the next day. There one is referring to mechanical energy. But in the case of the state of death, it's a period when we must regenerate our life force in order to take on another physical form. So uh, that is the aspect of life which Buddhism which in Daishonin described as Myoho, the law of life. But this law has another most important facet. Rengu that is described literally in the means a lotus Rengu. flower. And the lotus flower is quite a unique thing in the world of nature because it produces its flower and seed at the same time. Symbolism from Buddhist, in the, uh, from the point of view of Buddhist wisdom, is that uh, the appearance of the flower and seed at once represents the law of cause and effect. What Buddhism is saying is that every single action that we make in thought, word or deed is a cause. And at the moment that cause is made, the effect is immediately built into one's life. So the effect may not appear until much later when the circumstances and conditions are right for it. But nevertheless, it is actually built into one's life. So to give an all too simple example, if you go skiing when you're 15 or 19 and you damage your ankle in some way and you don't have it properly uh, attended to or the doctors make a bungle of it, it may give you no trouble whatsoever, uh, perhaps for 40 years. But as one's beginning to enter old age, then uh, you find yourself getting rheumatism or arthritis beginning it or whatever. And that's a very simple example of something that can be extremely subtle. So what Buddhism is saying is that every moment of life you're making causes. Therefore, every moment of life, you're creating effects which for a time are latent and then will appear in your life in one way or another. And the effect is always exactly related to the cause, so far as its value or non-value, anti-value is concerned. You make a great, noble and pure cause and Always the effect in one's own life when it appears will be great, noble, and pure. But if you make a, a bad cause, a cause, say, of hurting somebody, then the effect when it appears in your own life will be a similar form of hurt. So what Buddhism is teaching is that this law of cause and effect is absolutely inescapable. You can't escape it. In the old early days of Buddhism, they, they described it uh, in a, a sort of legendary manner as being like two small gods who sat on your shoulders. And one 
uh, was recording the causes and the other was making sure the effects were equivalent. But this is how this works. Uh, so, of course, once your eyes are open to this, again, you can see it working in one's own life. One can clearly, looking back over one's life, see where you've made a cause and it's produced an effect which is exactly relative to it. So then one gradually becomes adjusted to the realization that this is happening not just once a week, but every single moment. So every single moment of one's life, one is reacting to an effect which in its turn becomes a cause. So destiny or karma is the chain of that cause and effect. So of course, if one's basic state of life is, say, anger, then one, that tendency to be angry is revealed in causes which has effects. And the effects being such that they perpetuate that anger in a chain not only through one lifetime, but through many lifetimes. Because Buddhism also points out that the entity of life, even though it may go into its state of latency, uh, still will be carrying with it the pattern of cause and effect through until its next life, eternally. So therefore, when one comes back to the practice of Buddhism, again, the purpose of that practice is to give one the power to sustain making good, great, pure causes. So through making good, great, pure causes, through the practice of Buddhism and sustaining that day in and day out, you are gradually overcoming or lightening uh, the bad karma that you may have created in the past through making bad causes. So this is, I think, one of the greatest points of the Buddhist philosophy. Not only is the philosophy itself incredibly deep and wide and rounded and all-embracing, but also you are given a practice that gives you the power to sustain living that philosophy. The world's been full of many philosophies, but how many of those philosophies have given human beings a practice to actually live it, not just today and tomorrow, not just uh, as an all-night wonder, not just as a craze for six months, but for year after year after year, for a lifetime and more. This is truly the amazing thing. So, uh, you can see now that Myoho and Renge uh, express the rhythm of life uh, in two in its two different main facets. One being the cycle of manifestation and latency, and the other being, if you like, running through it like a shuttle uh, in a weaving machine, the law of cause and effect. So this is incredible in a way. In a way it seems simple, yet in a way it's unbelievably complex and complicated when one tries to imagine the pattern of all those causes and effects, every minute of every living thing's life, running through this cycle of manifestation and latency. Now the last the word death is we kyo. Know. Nam, devotion, myoho, to this incredible rhythm or behavior of universal life, Renge, including at its foundation the law of cause and effect, and Kyo. Kyo meaning literally sound or sutra, teaching, communication, or even in modern terms, vibration. So what Buddhism is saying is that everything in the entire universe is linked rhythmically through sound, through kyo. In other words, neither man, woman, nor any living thing 
is independent of every single other living thing in the entire universe. What I do at this moment is not just affecting you all, and me of course, not just affecting Friends House, which we're doing this lecture in, but affecting the entire universe. This is an incredible thought, isn't it? In other words, the ripple of the actions of every living thing is felt by everything else. So Buddhism describes this by a great principle which is known in Japanese as Esho Fune, the inseparability of man and his environment. Whatever uh, action, and that includes both spiritual and physical, a person makes, it's immediately reflected into everything in that person's environment. And since every environment overlaps with many other environments, therefore that effect is felt in those environments as well. And this goes on and on, outwards, 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 far into the boundless universe. So of course, if only people, especially in the West, maybe, had truly understood this principle, I don't think today there would be the incredible pollution and destruction of the environment which we see in so many parts. Maybe the word, because greed was perhaps stronger. But the fact is that this has occurred because no human being really understood this principle of Esho Fumi, of the absolute inseparability of oneself and the environment we exist in. So this environment reflects, and of course reflects in return on oneself. So supposing one's in the state of anger, you go into uh, a schoolroom or an office or back home to your family, and even without saying one word, that anger radiates into that environment. An angry person walking into a room, everybody can feel it without him saying anything, and as a matter of fact, without even looking at him. Of course it's true that anger reflects in red cheeks and glaring eyes, perhaps. But even without looking at a person, you can feel anger in a room. The same applies to hell. If someone's in hell, they have a tendency to drag everybody else into hell as well, if they could possibly do so. You feel that pull of that miserable frustration. And of course the same applies to Buddha. This is the important point. Just the same as you can precipitate others into hell or anger, you can also precipitate others into the state of Buddha. Therefore, if Buddha more and more becomes, becomes the main tendency of one's own life, one's environment will react quite naturally according. One's Buddha state in everything that surrounds one begins to react to one's own Buddha state and vice versa. So Buddhism is teaching uh, that the most important thing for human happiness is to elevate one's state of life so that one's environment reacts in that same elevated state. And of course this is why when people practice they discover that they're getting benefits. So it may seem almost like a miracle, almost sort of magical. You know, why is it that before I started chanting, you know, I went to my bank manager a hundred times and never would he give me a loan? Yet this month, after a month, chanting nam myoho uh, I go to him and he gives me it. It's an absurdly small example, but to some people it's an incredibly important one. Why is it? Because previously something in that person's life was really antagonizing or upsetting the bank manager. However just his cause for a loan, he never got it. But when that person has elevated his highest state of life, 
that reflects also in the behavior of the bank manager, and his boss for that matter, and his wife, and everybody else. So this, of course, principle, which is so fundamental to Buddhism, uh, one soon can begin to prove for one's own sake. So, uh, the chanting of nam myoho renge kyo therefore, is fundament fundamental not only to one's own happiness, but also for the happiness of your environment. Therefore, one can say that even one person chanting nam myoho renge kyo is beneficially affecting not only his own life, but certainly the life of his friends, uh, his relations, his family, and actually the entire planet called Earth and on out into the universe itself. So what I say today at this lecture is kyo. It's affecting your lives, whether nicely or nastily, I don't know. But nevertheless, it's affecting you. My environment is overlapping all of yours. Equally, each of your environments is overlapping each other. So the ripples of what I say go outwards to you and then who knows how far outwards from into each of your environments. Maybe when you get uh, down to breakfast tomorrow morning you say to your wife or something, well that my goodness that old fool was saying some stupid things last night. In which case the ripples aren't terribly good. But if you say, oh, that was really interesting, you know, and he said this and this and this, and why she can say, oh, really, that's rather interesting. And then she tells her friend, this is how the ripples go ever outwards. So that is, if you like, the work we close, of numb your I, would, I think I should mention the actual practice of it. So what the Shundai Shonin said was that we should chant nam myoho horenge kyo to our heart's content. So this means being very honest with oneself. I once heard uh, the president of our lay society say there is absolutely no point in one member boasting to another member how much daimoku or nam myoho renge kyo they chant. Because one person's life is totally, totally different to another person's life. So Nedrin Daishonin said you should chant to your heart's content. And the truth is that if you're really honest with yourself, you'll feel, I really should chant more today. Or to overcome that problem, I know I need to chant more. Or equally, if you're all tensed and work up and you're honest with yourself again, you can feel, no, that's enough, you know, for today. But it means being honest with yourself and as it were, checking yourself and making sure uh, that you're really sincerely uh, looking at your life and judging it calmly. But this is what Nichiren Daishonin said. In another Gosho he said, there are times when one Daimoku is enough and there are times when 10,000 Daimoku is not enough. In another Gosho he said, I have just chanted one Daimoku to help her to overcome her sickness. So of course, in that one daimoku, he will have put his whole life. But sometimes when we're feeling lazy or miserable or upset, certainly we're not putting our whole life into every daimoku. Anyway, not at the beginning of our practice. Therefore, Nichiren Daishonin said, you should chant it over and over again to your heart's content. It depends entirely your nature, your character, the type of problem that you desire to overcome, your needs, uh, the heaviness or the lightness of your karma, as we call it, or destiny, how much each person should chant. Though, uh, as a general guide to people, it's usually said that if you really wish to keep the life force flowing in you, uh, like uh, a stream of water throughout your lifetime, Round about 3,000 daimoku a day is uh, always adequate. So the truth is uh, that some people will go for many days, even weeks, chanting much less than that. Others will 
feel the desire to chant much more than that. In the end, what matters is the results, isn't it? What you can show for the effort you make. And always, if you're honest with yourself, you can judge whether you should do more or whether you can do a little less. But being human beings, with the negative state of life working in us, it's a good principle to do a bit more uh, than perhaps sometimes you feel you like to. This is the effort, isn't it, of none. So, through sitting up straight, with one's eyes open, not closed. Nam myoho renge kyo is not inward going only. It's not introspective only, though it includes introspection. You should sit up straight with your eyes open. And of course, in due course, you receive the object of devotion, which we call the Gohonzon, which is a scroll uh, with Chinese characters on it, subject of another lecture. Uh, you can fix your eyes on that and chant Nam myoho renge kyo. If you have no gongs and yet, it's best to choose uh, a blank wall or the sky or whatever you like that is not going to mesmerize you or upset you like looking at the turnip on a bit of wallpaper all the time. It could be disturbing. <laughs> but just something blank uh, to concentrate your mind and your life as you chant those words. So, of course, it's very strange. It's not just strange to us in the West. Sometimes we say, oh, this must be easy for the Japanese or the Chinese, but it's very difficult for us. It's just as strange for them. Sitting up straight, with one's eyes open, chanting words about which we understand very, very little. How can this possibly mean anything? Yet the truth of it is that once we begin to even chant once or twice or three times, seriously concentrating our mind, on the sound and those words, somehow we feel something profound about it. And of course, this is because it's awakening the Buddha state in our lives. The Buddha state in each one of our lives fully responds to Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. So, of course, you can say this is very mystic. But think how one's life responds to other sounds, often very deeply and very profoundly also. Sound of music in its various forms, noisy sounds, uh, harsh sounds, the singing of birds, rude sounds, all have, don't they, the deepest effect on our lives. What is being affected? The various states of life, which I went through at the beginning. Amongst those various states is Buddhahood. Therefore, if you chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, which is the life or the force of Buddha, the force of life itself, of course the reaction in you is profound, though it may take time to discover it. So, certainly when I first started to practice, you know, I felt uh, rather strange about the idea of it. In fact, the first time I chanted Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, I did it in secret when no one was looking. I felt so embarrassed about sitting, elderly gentleman, age 50 at the time, sitting or kneeling in my room and chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. But actually, for me anyway, when I first did it, and I did it as far as I remember for about a half an hour, first time I did it. It was an extremely profound and deep experience which I could never forget and which, of course, absolutely, totally influenced my whole life for the better. So, uh, whatever happens when one tries it, one needs to be, of course, serious. Though you don't understand it, your trusted friends maybe say, this thing works. This thing, you know, is changing my life for the better. So something stirs and you do it. Perhaps uh, only for a few minutes, but you do it sincerely and without a shadow of doubt, immediately, though it may not be apparent at once, effects 
are taking place in your life which will become manifest comparatively quickly. This is the truth. People discover so quickly that this practice works for themselves. And of course no one on earth can make one do it uh, by force. Really, uh, let's put it so, is it uh, it whilst we practice, uh, as you know, we have uh, beads which we use to help concentration. There's nothing holy or sacred about the beads, in fact. Though, of course, uh, they become part of one's life when we use them a lot. Uh, but, in fact, the beads represent the fact you know, that, that life is in your hand. You place them on your two hands in this way, and place the palms and fingers together in the natural state of prayer. And this represents life in your hands. Here are your head and two arms, and here's the two legs, and you cross them in the re middle, representing the waist, and each bead is one of the 108 desires which are uh, taught in Buddhism as being inherent in life and I'm certainly not going through them all now and I couldn't anyway from memory and also here there are four small beads which the qualities uh, of purity and eternity uh, life force and strength and wisdom which comes from the actual practice in fact of course uh, there are more formal meanings. Three, three tassels, in fact, are the Buddha, the law, and the priest, the three treasures as they're known. So I won't go into that now. What I want to emphasize is that this is representing that life is in your hands and no one else's. If one practices as the Buddha taught, then great benefit will come. If you don't practice as the Buddha taught, also, that is bringing of the hands together, represent the mutual possession of the ten worlds. We remember we talking about this last lecture. That each of those ten states of life in itself contains the ten. In other words, even a Buddha has hell, hunger, anger working in him. Just as a human being in hell has Buddha in him. This is a very important principle because it shows clearly that the Buddha is a human being and that human beings all have Buddhahood. So that is what this position represents. So uh, this is how we practice, alertly, sitting up straight, uh, chanting the words clearly and resonantly, not shouting them and not whispering them. After all, these words are expressing the rhythm and force of life. So naturally, they should be firm and clear, dynamic, perhaps is the best word to use, and very rhythmical. And through that, as we chant nam myoho renge kyo with our mouths, hear it with our ears, uh, at the same time, in our minds, we are concentrating on our prayers, on our desires and wishes, for the betterment of ourselves and also for the happiness of other people. The Buddhism relates practice for yourself and practice to others as an absolute necessity or part of the rhythm of life itself. If we practice for ourselves only, we'd not be in rhythm with the natural rhythm of life. Equally, if we practice for others only, we would not be in rhythm. The rhythm of life is both to nurture oneself, isn't it, as well as to nurture others. We can be of little use if we're a pathetic, uh, a scarred, battered plant ourselves. Uh, at the same time, uh, how could we you know, impress anybody else? We have to have strength, life force, and uh, a vibrant life in order to influence our environments and indeed to have the strength to help others. So it's a two-way thing. So I think I've this said is very nature quite of enough, and I've also gone on rather a long time. Uh, but I hope that that's sort of beginning to become clear to you.
And there's still, if you like, perhaps five minutes. If anyone has a burning question, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Has anyone got anything particular that has puzzled them about what I've been saying? All right. Okay, well, what I suggest is, just in case some of you have not heard the chant, that those members who are here now will just turn and face this blank wall and chant Nam Myoho Rengekyo three times uh, and you'll all hear what it's all about. Nam Myoho